Okay, and welcome to Graham's chemistry class. Um, hopefully this works out well. Um, I have my uh, PowerPoint here for you and I'm gonna walk you guys through it. Okay, we're gonna start off with the history of the atom. Okay, this would be chapter five in your textbook if you wanna read your textbook. And basically uh, the goal of this uh, lecture is I'm gonna talk to you guys about uh, how scientists and, and uh, the idea of the atom has developed over time. Okay, so atomic structure, part one. All right. So, what if I do this? Let's try this. Oh, that's something else I didn't do. Okay, well, luckily I don't have to write on the board today. All right, so this is my first video of the distance learning series. It has been a challenge trying to find ways to record it. And then uh, I haven't edited it this yet. And I don't know if I will. I, I, time is of the essence. And part of this is a learning process. So please be patient. Anyhow, a uh, long time ago, around uh, 4900 BC, there was this guy named Democritus. And Democritus theorized that if you split something again and again and again, you'd eventually come to basically a, a building block called an atomos. So he was the first to propose that everything was made of atoms. And so that was Democritus. Again, this is four, uh, 490 BC. So this is quite a, quite a while ago. Okay. So just imagine taking you know, a rock, and you break the rock down, eventually you get down to the size of, the sand, uh, of a grain of sand. And if you kept cutting that grain of sand down smaller and smaller and smaller, sooner or later, you've got to get to a basic, a basic building block of whatever matter it's made of. All right. Now, this is 1803. So quite, quite a bit of time has passed. I'm going to say about 2300 years. Okay. Now John Dalton comes along, and he was known as the father of the father of modern chemistry. Now John Dalton was an English teacher. Science really hadn't been developed a whole lot yet, and basically he worked at a school and and had access to science supplies. And he started doing experiments on um, you know if you mix a certain quantity of this with a certain quantity of that, how much of this product will you get? And he came, he came up with a, some concepts on chemistry. All right, so this is a picture of John Dalton. And he's known for resurrecting the idea of the atoms from the Greeks. All right, now, Dalton came up with this atomic theory. And you got to remember, this was back in the 1800s. So the equipment that they had was not as technical or as advanced is what we have and you have to say you know considering this guy what he had to work with electricity hadn't even been invented yet he did pretty good so Dalton's atomic theory elements are composed of indivisible particles called atom okay so he believed that if you broke materials down smaller and smaller and smaller eventually you would go ahead and get these things called atoms and he believed that atoms could not be broken apart. Okay, now I want to point out to you guys, we know that this is no longer true. We have invented what are called atom smashers or particle accelerators, and we've been able to slam particles into atoms and make the atoms fall into pieces. But back then, electricity wasn't even around, so all in all, this is a fair assumption for Dalton to make. Now, atoms of the same element are identical, Okay, which means basically, hey, you got an oxygen atom, the oxygen atom is going to look like an oxygen atom. Okay, you have a hydrogen atom, it's going to behave and, and act like a, a hydrogen atom. Now, the problem is, and again, he didn't, you know, all back then they had microscopes and graduated cylinders and flasks. Uh, you couldn't really see an atom or do uh, like a re really good test with them. So I'm going to just let you guys know that this is not 100% true. Uh, atom 
atoms of the same element do behave similarly, but they're not identical. Some of them may have a few extra neutrons or a few less neutrons, which is going to change their weight, and we call those isotopes. Okay, he believed that elements aren't unique. Well, what does he mean by that? He means hydrogen is different from helium. Okay, so if you've got a balloon of hydrogen and a balloon of helium, you can let them both go. They're both going to float up to the ceiling. Okay, however, if you went ahead and took a match and you put it close to one of those balloons, the helium balloon is just going to pop, but the hydrogen balloon would explode. Okay, so they may appear to be similar, but they don't behave similarly. They will have different properties. Okay. Hydrogen's explosive, helium's inert. Atoms can combine to form compounds in whole number ratios. Okay. Well, this is true. Okay. You know, for every um, for every two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, you end up with water. Okay. You don't have half of an oxygen atom reacting with one of a hydrogen atom in order to get water. Okay. So you always have to have uh, entire elements. Okay. So you're not going to have half of atoms reacting and another half just laying around doing whatever. The whole entire atoms have to react and so therefore it's always going to be a whole number ratio. So for example, if you, if you had, um, well, I'm not going to write it on here yet. This is my first video. Let's not get too fancy. All right. In chemical reactions, atoms are combined, separated, and rearranged. Okay, he proposed this, and this is true. You, you will learn about in this course a, a various number of reactions. You'll have single replacement, double replacement, combination, decomposition, and combustion. Those are the five that I'll teach you, and uh, we'll go into that later after you guys uh, understand how to write chemical equations. All right, so in review on this slide here, these are Dalton's atomic theories, concepts of his, of his theory. The first two here, uh, atoms are indivisible. That is no longer true. We've proven that atoms can be broken. Atoms of the same element are identical. Uh, we've proved now that there are these things called isotopes, which basically mean heavy, uh, heavy or light elements of the same type. They have a different number of neutrons, but the same number of photons. And then everything down here, elements are unique. They combine in whole number ratios. And basically, the atoms just kind of rearrange themselves when they go through a chemical reaction. All three of those things are still true today. All right, so let's go further into time. Now, J.J. Thompson arrives on the scene. It's 1898. Okay. Electricity has been invented now. And this guy is basically playing with different elements in the gaseous form uh, and then running electricity through them. Uh, now, the electricity he ran through him was a high voltage direct current. Direct current means the electrons only travel one way. You might learn about that in physics. And anyhow, he built this thing called a cathode ray tube. And anyhow, that's a picture of what it looked like. There's another sketch of it. And then I'm going to focus on this picture right here. OK, so one thing I want you guys to know about in this class, I'm going to, uh, the way atoms react and ions react, opposites attract. Positive is attracted to negative. Now, when you look at this picture here, he basically took this tube, he filled it up with an element in its gaseous form. So I'm just going to keep it simple and we'll say nitrogen, oxygen, uh, helium, neon, you know, things that normally exist in their gas form. And then he, he hooked an electrical lead over here, an electrical lead over here, and he applied a high voltage. Now, ignore these two plates for now and just pay attention to this positive here and this negative here. 
And basically what happened was the electrons, or, or at this point in time, we don't even know what they are. He just noticed, hey, there's these beams. And so all of a sudden these beams were shooting across, going from one side to the other. Now remember, this electricity, so it travels at the speed of light. And basically this would just glow like a light bulb. So if you guys have ever seen neon lights uh, glow, like the, the hotel vacancy signs, things like that, the fluorescent uh, lights that are in your classroom, the big long long tube ones, they, you turn them on, you don't see the, the, the electricity going across, you just see it all of a sudden glow. Well, that's what this guy experienced, except he experienced it no matter what element he put inside these light bulbs. Well, what that proved to him is that no matter what element he put in there, all of these atoms in there must have this, have that whatever that stuff is that's causing these lines. Okay, so they all have the same property. All right, so he ups this experiment a little bit to, now. Now he's put a negative charge plate here and a positive charge plate here, and he hooked that up to you know like a Verovac or a a, a, a variable, well, no, this was, this never mind, could have been a variable back. This was, this was DC power. So it was probably more or less just a resistor. But anyhow, he looked at the power source where he could adjust the voltage. Now, when there was no voltage coming between these two plates, he found that he could get this beam and it would just travel straight across. Okay. Now, if he made this bottom plate positive, then the beam would bend downward. If he made the top plate positive, then the beam would bend upward, okay? And depending on what the difference in voltage is, how strong the voltage, you know, the more positive versus negative is, it would bend the beam more. So the more positive this became, the more those, whatever they are, and they were later named to be electrons, but whatever those particles are, start to bend down even further and further and further, the greater this voltage goes. Now remember, opposites attract. So whatever this is, is always attracted to the positive and likes repel. And I'll talk about more about that later. And so this is negative and this doesn't want to go anywhere near that. So that must mean that they must have the same charge. Okay. So in the end, this guy knows all these elements that he's put in there have some particles that cause these lines. When he runs these particles through this, this hole here, and they're coming over towards this plate here, they form this beam or ray, cathode ray, and that ray is attracted to positive voltage. So that, because opposites attract and negative wants to travel towards positive, that, that that's basically letting us know whatever those particles are, they must be negative because they're always traveling towards positive. Like, now, the interesting thing about this is this actually ends up being developed into a TV because if you control which way this beam goes and you have like, let's say a phosphor screen, and I know you young kids out there, you may have seen them, they're disappearing. But when I was a kid, you'd see them on the side of the road out in the country and there, there were these big giant huge TVs, they were like a piece of furniture. And if you stuff a magnet on them, it would totally mess them up and then they would have to be degaussed. But Anyhow, my point being is you could aim this beam at, at, a, at a phosphorus plate or a phosphorus screen, sorry, and it would cause it to light up. And by making this beam go across and light up the dots in a certain area, you could get pictures. And that's where the first black and white TV came from. Then later, if you, if you ever flick water on one of those old TVs, you'll see the primary colors there. And then somehow they, they managed to get it to where that, that cathode ray was actually hitting the colors in the formation actually start giving you color TV so you could uh, have different colors by mixing those primary colors together. So anyhow, side note, not a chemistry question, but this actually ends up turning into uh, the TV than, than the color TV as time goes on. Now this is, uh, again, 19, or sorry, 1898. So electricity is just, just being invented. All right. so. What's Thompson do, or what did Thompson do? Thompson discovered that all elements have electrons, or at least the ones that he tested in the gases form. All right, now, that's all we know about atoms. We just know that, hey, we've got an atom there. There's this thing called 
uh, or this, this this particle in there that's negative, which he, he called electrons. And so he came up with something called the plum pudding model. And I know, again, this is an old term, plum pudding. Uh, to me, it looks more like bread than pudding. But, but basically, you have little pieces of plum in there. You break the, you, you bake the bread together. I know it's pudding, but it's like a bread. And they're just stuck in there. He doesn't know anything else about the atom. There's an atom. It's got electrons in it. And so this was the first model of the atom from Thompson. Okay. So negatively charged particles are stuck inside the atom. Oh, go back. Okay. So those are just negative electrons, and that's all we know about the atom at this point in time. All right. Now, Rutherford comes along. This is 1909. And what Rutherford does is he shoots alpha particles, okay, which I'll cover later. That's a helium nuclei. Alpha particles are the heaviest particles of radiation that we know of. And he's shooting them just to play around at this gold foil. And I was talking to you guys about a phosphorus screen. Well, this, this here is similar to that. It's a fluorescent screen. And when it, get, when it gets energized or something, hits it with a lot of energy, it glows. Okay, so if you guys think of those stars that you may have had on the ceiling of your bedroom when you were a kid, sometimes you might have had glow in the dark toys which I've got some here. Well, oh, it's over there. I'm, if you're in my class, it would be nice. I could say, hey, look, you guys have ever seen one of these? But basically, you put the toy or the Play-Doh. I remember uh, Silly Putty. You put that in, in the light, and it would glow in the dark well, as it absorbs energy. Well, this is similar to that. And when this radiation hits it, it glows. Now, here, and by the way, this foil here, this foil here is extremely thin. It's supposed to only be two atoms thick. And he figured these particles are just going to fly straight through here, and they're all just going to hit here, and that'll be that. And he is just basically testing the pen penetrability of alpha particles on gold. Okay, and gold at that time, well, it still is, pretty dense metal. And uh, he, his original hypothesis was that most of the uh, particles are going to go straight through. Now, what he observed was some of them actually got knocked all the way back, okay? And that, that puzzled him. He's like, well, what did they hit? These alpha particles should have gone straight through, but they must have hit something massive to knock them back. And so then he had to stop and think about, well, what did they hit? You know, what else is there in the atom? Okay, uh, electrons should be able to not be knocked out of the way really easy. And so there's something there. Oh, I do want to point something else out. Most of them went straight through, okay, but only a few were knocked back. So it's not like a whole bunch got knocked back. So this led him to conclude that there must be a dense center in the center of the atom that these alpha particles are hitting, okay. So, but most of them went through. So that also led him to believe that the atoms got to be mostly empty space because most of the particles aren't hitting anything. But the ones that are getting knocked back or ricocheted off to the side, those guys there uh, are getting something really sol solid. Now, also want to go back to remember opposites attract and likes repel. Now, they knew alpha particles were positive. Okay, they knew that. And if the whatever was in the middle of the atom that had all this mass, if that was made of electrons, well, then that positive alpha particle wouldn't even want to come out the other end. It would want to stick to it because opposites attract. Kind of like when you have a north pole of a magnet and a south pole of a magnet, and they stick together, okay? So that would be opposites attracting. Well, if that was so, then the alpha particle would want to stick to the center of that of that nucleus or that or that whatever's in the center of that atom. But instead, it didn't want to have anything to do with it at all. It was flying off backwards, flying off this direction, that direction. If it just kind of went a little bit by it, it may just uh, go off its course just a little bit. So alpha particles did not like whatever was in the center of the atom. And since we do know likes repel, and they knew that alpha particles were positive, well, then that led him to believe that there's something really, really dense in the center of that atom because it's not moving. And it's shoving those, at, at the time, alpha particles, again, the heaviest part of radiation that we, 
we know of, uh, were being bent out of their way or totally pushed backwards. And so, anyhow, this led him to believe that the atom is mostly empty space. And if, if the center of the atom was made of electrons, then those alpha particles would have been attracted to it. So those electrons aren't in the nucleus or whatever is, is this massive. Uh, again, I talked about that. The center of the atom must be dense because it, knocked, it didn't get knocked out of the way. It knocked the alpha particles back. And it must be positively charged because the alpha particles didn't want to have anything to do with it because like charges repel. And since most of those particles went straight through, this led him to believe that the center of the atom, or what they later came to label as the nucleus, must be very, very small because not very many of those particles ever came in contact with it. The alpha particles that I'm talking about came in contact with it. Most of them passed straight through. And so the nucleus is very small compared to the overall size of the atom. It's one ten thousandth the di diameter of an atom. Okay, one ten thousandth. That's pretty small. Okay. And if the nucleus were the size of a softball, the nearest electron would be about a kilometer away. Okay, so then I got the next slide has even a better example. If the nucleus were the size of a pea, and you were to go out on the football field and put it on the 40 yard line, okay, it would weigh 250 tons. Now, I don't know if you've ever stuck yourself on a rock or a brick or something. But something the size of a pea that weighs 250 tons, if you accidentally kicked it, it's not going anywhere. And the fact that it's the size of a pea, you're going to jack your foot up big time. And let's see, the size of the atom would be the size of a football field. So you put this pea on the 50 yard line, okay, the whole football field is the atom. And let's pretend you decided, hey, let's get out our high powered rifles and shoot at that pea. Okay, you, that, that, that high-powered rifle or, or the bullet from the high-powered rifle would be basically like an alpha particle. And when it hits something, a bullet hits something that's 250 tons, that 250 tons isn't going to go anywhere. Okay, and the fact that it's the size of a pea in the middle of a football field, and let's pretend you're not aiming, you're just taking shots across the football field. Well, the pea is so small compared to the overall size of the football field that most of the bullets are not never going to hit this pea. They're just going to go right on by. Okay. And if one did happen to hit that pea, and again at 250 tons, bam, it's going to ricochet off. If you hit it on the side, it's going to go off sideways. So this demonstrates how empty atoms are. It also would my description also demonstrates how dense the nucleus is and uh, how it does, you know, it, it doesn't want to get knocked out of the way. Okay, so Rutherford's conclusion, matter is mostly empty space. Okay. All right, now later Rutherford discovers the proton in 1919. See, in that last experiment, he just discovered the nucleus. He doesn't know what's in the nucleus. Now, he predicted it, it was a positive particle, the proton. And again, the reason he predicted that is because alpha particles were known to be positive and the alpha particles wanted to have nothing to do with the proton. So uh, basically the proton ends up being discovered as being a positive particle. The proton's characteristics, it has a plus one charge. You do not have to know the mass but the reason I show you the mass is because later when I talk about the neutrons, the, the mass of a neutron is so extremely close to that of a proton. It, it, it's, it's only difference in weight is by that of an electron. So if you took a negative electron and a positive proton and were able to get those stuck together, you would have this thing called the neutron, which I haven't talked to you guys about. So at this point in time, all you guys know about is there's these things in an atom called an electron. And this guy here discovers the proton. So we got two pieces of the atom that we know at this point in time. And again, my point is you don't have to know the mass, but, but realize 
it's it's pretty heavy, okay, compared to let's say the electron. And the symbol down the road you guys may use is going to be P with a plus sign. Okay. So plus one charge, P with a plus sign. That's what I need you to know regarding Rutherford's uh, proton that he discovered. All right, so let's see what you guys know. Uh, can atoms be divided or broken into pieces? And hopefully you guys know that that is yes. I hope you guys know about particle accelerators or atom smashers to where they get these particles to go around and around and around super fast, super fast, and then they aim it at an atom and they can get, get the atom to fly apart. So can atoms be divided or broken into pieces? The answer is yes. Okay, next question. Are all carbon atoms identical? Okay, so based on asking if it's a carbon atom, it's the same element, are, are they all identical? And the answer is no. Okay, if you guys took biology, you should have learned about something called carbon-14. Okay, and carbon-14 is a radioactive form of carbon that they use for carbon dating. Okay, so you're going to have some atoms that have more neutrons, some that have fewer, but they have the same number of protons, so they are the same exact element, and they just weigh different amounts. So those of you who may be familiar with the development of the nuclear bomb, okay, you have different forms of uranium, uranium-235 and uranium-238. There's more isotopes than just that, but my point being is they can be the identical, the same element, but they may weigh just a little bit different because they have different numbers of neutrons. Okay, what is the charge on an electron? Okay, so when Thomson made his cathode ray tube, that beam of particles that he didn't know what they were always traveled towards the positive plate or the positive voltage plate. They know opposites attract and likes repel. And so whatever was inside that beam that was later, they were later called the electrons, must be negative because it always traveled towards the positive plate. What is the charge of a proton? Okay, protons are positive. And again, what led Rutherford to believe this? Well, when he shot those uh, alpha particles, which were known to be positive at that gold foil, those, pro or those uh, excuse me, alpha particles did not want to have anything to do with that solid nucleus. They didn't get attracted to it. So the proton must be positive because like charges repel. And where is the majority of the mass of an atom located? Well, the majority of the particles Rutherford shot at the gold foil passed straight through. Only a few were deflected or diverted in different directions. So that led him to believe that the mass is located in the center of the atom and it's concentrated there. And the area outside the atom must be where the electrons are because um, you know, if, if the electrons were located in the center of the atom, then that alpha particle would have been attracted to it. 